Welcome to the Indian Silicon Valley podcast. I'm your host Jivraj and today I have with me a very special guest. Join me in welcoming Vikram Vedyanathan, Managing Director of Matrix Partners India. Thank you so much Vikram for joining me. Very excited to be hosting you today. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. Great to hear that Vikram and I think what stands out about this conversation and your career is just the amazing time span you spent and the amazing companies you partnered with so I want to dive deeper into so much of that vantage point but before we get there I like to start on a rather abstract note and understand from you what the velocity of decision making in today's ecosystem means for you because we've all heard about you know the conjecture and the chatter around the speed of decision making uh, the frenzy of capital the overcapitalized ecosystem what not but before like without getting into all of that uh, considering the nature of venture partnerships which can be very intricate very long very in depth how do you make decisions at scale and with speed i'd love to know that from you on a more broader level so first it's just a fantastic time to be a founder um <laughs> because it's it's uh, the amount of capital now chasing founders uh, is at a all time high in india and i think it's only going to get higher and deservedly so given yeah. the quality of both founders and markets coming in that does force us to make mm-hmm. a lot of decisions in a short period of time right and uh, i think it forces you to be very thoughtful about where you spend time first which mm-hmm. is which sectors do you want to spend time in which kind of founding teams do you want to spend time in which stage do you want to spend time in mm-hmm. uh, and the more thoughtful you are about where you spend your time it's you get yourself into easier situations where you have some edge in making those decisions faster than others right. the first is where you spend time i think the second is what you do almost before the meeting right so the mm-hmm. how much pre work you do before mm-hmm. you come in uh, come into a meeting can actually okay. decide how that meeting goes and how far along you get towards making a decision so some mm-hmm. of this is do you have a thesis or not and a lot of time when we don't have a thesis we just don't spend time especially if it's a high velocity situation because you don't have any edge in making that decision at all right. second is to do a, almost everyone else in the mm-hmm. ecosystem knows more about that particular opportunity than you do and if you are in that mindset that going into the room uh, you have some thesis but people know more about the founders people know more about the opportunity so if you just talk to everybody in the ecosystem very quickly right whether it's mm-hmm. customers whether it's references people that you know these founders have worked with whether it is experts and angels mm-hmm. uh, who have a very different lens of looking at the world mm-hmm. and if you talk to enough of those people beforehand coming in you mm-hmm. can actually improve the quality of discussion know mm-hmm. what question to ask and therefore will elicit sort of the best response from the founders right after that i think it is about actually often what we do even at that point in time you talk about venture partnerships is to make sure which amongst all of us is best suited to mm-hmm. make this decision uh, yeah. at the, and so there is interest there is you know you know what my partner would like or what one of our one of our deal leaders would like so we pass the ball actively to mm-hmm. someone who is sort of most predisposed to making a good decision as well as a yes decision on a particular deal so got it figure out all the pre work figure out who's best suited to it and then hopefully you have a better recipe for making a, a yeah. decision the last thing that i would do is that we force polarization right you do mm-hmm. have to make up your mind pretty early right mm-hmm. is this something that is exciting and if it's not mm-hmm. exciting right off the bat then mm-hmm. it's hard for you to get to a yes in a in a short period of time right and are there deal breakers which will which will prevent you from saying yes mm-hmm. so if either of these two situations happen very early you again make things easy for you and you know don't force yourself into a lot of maybe situations which mm-hmm. forces you into tough decisions frankly Frank, it forces you into non decisions no no that's fair and i think uh, that's very interesting to hear but you know the reason i also asked that question is because you spoken about in the past how you need to really develop these relationships with founders because fundamentally that's what it also boils down to and we've also heard of these nuances and comparisons that venture partnerships are like marriages they last a decade what not so what i want to double click on is how do you develop that sort of a relation with a founder in today's day and age and how do you know it's going to be right for the long run both for the founder and the partner or the venture investor in this case that would be very fascinating to know so before uh, it's sort of like uh, you had a long dating period mm-hmm. now you have a speed dating period 
Yeah. And so the question is, in that speed dating period, how do you optimize uh, mm. success for a long relationship slash marriage, right? Yeah. I I think it is maybe two three things that we do. And my one is encourage the founders also to do a lot of references mm. with our founder groups. Okay. And secondly, we do a lot of references on the founders because people who have worked with them or know them will know more about them than we ever will in those yeah. you know few hours that we are spending with them. Right. So getting that collective knowledge mm-hmm. for them from our founders and for us from their, uh, their sort of immediate ecosystem is one big thing. Mm-hmm. Second is to spend a lot of time in different situations. And whether it is you know, hanging out, getting a coffee, getting a drink, sometimes doing an activity, going for a walk, Sometimes mm-hmm. in a very informal situation at uh, either our, uh, either my house or their house, mm-hmm. uh, it gives you a whole person perspective about the founder. Uh, mm-hmm. I've even heard VCs and you know, especially in China and so on, where again the speed of decision making is is crazy. They you know go for like uh, they go on trips, they go on massages, all sorts of things. Right, so you mm-hmm. figure out different contexts, which gets you a whole person perspective about them. And right. third, I wouldn't say force conflict type situations, but force situations which provoke a lot of thinking mm. or, and, and which are sort of maybe some obtuse choices or choices that con- uh, are contra to their point of view and so on. Mm. Mm. Because then it tells you how these conversations are going to happen. Right. Um, so I wouldn't pick a fight for the sake of picking a fight. <laughs> yeah. But you do want to figure out if there is a if there is an if there is a chance of conflict, which by the way, hundred percent will happen mm-hmm. along the journey, yeah. how do they handle it? What is right. their basis for handling it? Is there basis for handling ego? Is there basis of handling that I want to be right? Is there mm-hmm. basis of hand, handling people that I want to carry everyone along? Is mm-hmm. there basis of handling what is the best answer? Mm-hmm. Uh, is the basis of handling what gives you the most alpha on growth? It tells you a lot about right. how how would they deal with the. Uh, conflicting situation as well as sort of different choices no i think no that's very very thoughtful vikram and i love that uh, the two best answers you know like i've heard a couple of folks say that you know either do the airport test of if you're willing to spend time with the founder for like 6 hours if your flight is unlocked or if you know you spend time with like on a strategy session and you know that tells you so people have their decodes but i loved hearing that uh, that brings me to point and since we're at this uh, you come from a interesting background yourself and you know you spent some time you come from an engineering background who turned into consultant and then came to the venture world, right? Uh, having been through such diverse experiences and also now having spent considerable time in the space, uh, how have your how has your style evolved over the years when it comes to venture investing? And maybe if you can decode for us, what is it that you look for when investing in companies? I think that'll be great for just more context overall. So there are two parts to that question. One is a journey. And then the mm-hmm. second is sort of what I look for and, and, and so on. Um, you know, hindsight, uh, all journeys seem like they, uh, they were the perfect path to where mm-hmm. you were, but it is never planned. Yeah. And, uh, I just think that, that a lot of the things that I, uh, did led to uh, where I am today. So I started off life as an engineer, uh, building products. Um, and a lot of them were sort of core tech engineering, embedded systems type products, mm-hmm. had a fantastic experience at a mid-stage startup based out of Jerusalem. Uh, and with an India office and then was employee one at a startup as well. So all of those experiences, when I, when I think about them, it was because I was just very curious about the world of startups. And this is, um, you know, we're talking early 2000s. Yeah. So there, you know, we didn't have that much in India, but there was, there was stuff happening in the world. And so there was a very high degree of curiosity that I want to be part of some startup. Mm-hmm. Um, and honestly, at that point of time, you know, whatever I was doing, it was because I wanted to start up for the sake of starting up, which is actually not a good reason to start up. And that's why some of those things didn't, uh, didn't succeed. I sort of meandered into B school, uh, primarily because I was good at exams and I, I got in. And then equally so meandered into McKinsey um, because it seemed like a great place to start. And it was a fantastic place to start. Mm-hmm. And it gave me a great way of understanding ambiguous situations quickly understanding people, especially founders and top management and how 
they make decisions being comfortable in boardrooms and so on and finally being able to learn anything new very quickly but mm-hmm. i ran out of steam pretty quickly on consulting and even in consulting i started drifting back to hey what's happening in the startup world digital ecosystem i started writing reports about that even though we didn't have clients who wanted to do it and then i just realized i had to be part of the startup ecosystem mm-hmm. and ended up at matrix and i remember telling abhinesh at that time that uh, i'll stay 2 3 years after that i'm going to start up i right? didn't all my arrogance i was you know i'm this vc is not for me mm-hmm. and i'll discover what are the great ideas and then i will start up and i think i didn't discover what great ideas are but i discovered what great founders are and mm-hmm. there was a revelation that i would not be a great founder mm-hmm. and i would have been a reasonable founder i could have actually built something reasonable but the level of i think delusion and i mean that in the most positive sense that belief mm-hmm. uh, uh, in yourself that you can impact a problem mm-hmm. and then being able to sell that vision to the exclusion of all objectivity to the world for 7 10 years i didn't have and it is truly a a quality that the forces of nature in founders have mm-hmm. and i didn't have that but i liked the breadth of problems i liked i had a healthy mix of being able to spot reward and an objectivity in making decisions which i thought could make me a reasonable investor and that journey sort of worked out for me today nice no that that's fantastic there are a couple of crucial points you mentioned there right and when you talk about founders and define them the way you did i also like to call venture as a sport of identifying outliers after all right and when we talk about outlier founder journeys considering that you've partnered with some companies for almost like 5 7 years and even more sometimes if you had to maybe you know lay down for us some you know really crucial traits of outlier founders who have evolved over the journey of a company how would you like to you know express that yeah it's interesting and you know no two founders are the same <laughs> yeah. um and it's strange you know i i talked about this le- level of uh, of delusion and belief in mm-hmm. yourself yeah i think it has to be coupled with intellectual honesty it's a very very potent mix that mm-hmm. you truly believe in yourself that you can change the world mm-hmm. at the same time you have an intellectual honesty on this is where you need to grow and the mm-hmm. best founders have that that hey i need to grow in this dimension hey my company needs to be able to deal with this changing environment and mm-hmm. if you are able to couple these two that's actually the the great great founders the second is the, what differentiates founders from i think uh managers or leaders <laughs> is their resourcefulness and being mm-hmm. able to generate resources out of thin air you will yeah. see founders where you think that you know the ba- their back is against a the wall they're out of options and they will essentially make the wall magically disappear or they will uh, they will figure out resources that help them jump over or get around the wall or something yeah. and being able to generate resources out of thin air is probably the the, the next thing uh and the third is everyone is a resource mm-hmm. and figuring out even if you're not the best person to actually do this for their company who is because somebody or the other has experienced this problem or has parts of the answer that they're looking for so it might be a board member it might be an investor it might be another founder it might be a hire that you're looking for so they're always thinking about how do i get that person who knows the answer and that's the third i i would say big trait uh, founders are, uh, that i've seen in founders i guess the last one which is you know which i think everyone acknowledges is the level of ambition that founders have is just unparalleled and i think the ambition that lasts right there's lots of different ways of defining it there's yeah. money uh there's you know valuation there's you know lots of sort of markers but i think those motivators run out pretty quickly mm. and founders who sort of rediscover why they started the company they start a company with pretty altruistic intention which is to solve a problem that they experienced or to create this big impact in the world and at some point of time you know there is a the founder at race right? <laughs> and they are yeah. you know they are in that 
they're in that motion which is you know what's the next thing what's the next thing what's the next thing right it might be the next revenue milestone next valuation milestone all of those kind of things and then at some point of time they discover why they start or rediscover why they started the company which is to change the world that this mm-hmm. is the world how i found it and mm-hmm. this is how the world will be mm-hmm. after i'm done with it and once you rediscover that then you know nothing stops them because then they can just keep going forever because that's something that they are defining for themselves versus the world defining it for them wow no that that's phenomenal i think that's a very very succinct explanation of you know what outlier founder traits can look like and i love that uh, but since we're at this i think the other aspect of what you spoke about was identifying rewards right and i think uh, wins in venture like there can be multiple definitions for it and of course there's a quantitative side to everything but if you look at the qualitative aspects of it right uh, as an investor considering you are actively involved in a bunch of your companies or actually actively also scouting for the next big thing how do you perhaps you know think of wins in venture and what defines it for you i would love to know that see venture investing um is a fantastic way of life right and for me i want to do this uh, mm-hmm. forever i don't i keep saying that i'll do it till i die and, and i don't need anyone to pay me uh, i'd like to get paid right now but at some <laughs> point of time no no one needs to pay me to do this because it's a it's a role uh, mm-hmm. that forces you to keep learning mm-hmm. and you get to be part of these people's journeys which are founders who are changing the world so yeah. you that's your role your role is to keep learning about something new find mm-hmm. these people who are going to change the world using that something new and then you get to go on these amazing journeys from them and then you get to repeat yeah so i just think it's a fantastic way to live because it yeah. keeps you young it forces you to keep learning and mm. uh, you keep growing and i think for me the wins are exactly about that you get to something early mm-hmm. either it's a space it's an area that that you sort of spotted it's just something that that you found interesting uh, and then you went deep in that area mm. and then it suddenly became really big that's the that's the satisfaction that you get in venture and the more of those journeys and that's how i define a win now mm-hmm. that leads to you making money for your lps and your investors mm-hmm. uh, and that's that, that's my that's my job but the win comes from being able to get to something early and seeing it grow and mm-hmm. that gives you energy to go back and do the same thing again now what do you learn from your wins mm-hmm. i think first you learn you just get confidence it's a confidence and patience game and you get mm-hmm. the confidence that you have to go big right. and unless you're going big right that you're investing aggressively early and then you're doubling down much faster on something that is working that's mm-hmm. what leads to wins right and you just get more confidence to do that i think the second thing is that it gives you a sense of gut and being able to trust your gut more and more yeah and uh, i forgot who i which investor i read maybe it was carl icahn i am now forgetting uh, mm-hmm. and he, you know he was talking about his investment process and so on and one of the th- curious things that he had said was listen to your body when you're making a decision which is sort of on the margin and he was talking mm-hmm. about you know how he was getting a backache or a stomach upset or something repeatedly and his body was telling him that this is causing him too much stress in that making that decision therefore it's a bad decision mm-hmm. now uh, i'm not carl icahn but, but now you you'd start tra- trusting your gut Mm. a lot more in those moments on yeah. either walking away or leaning forward really hard on those decisions and be on the point you don't second guess it yeah i think the last thing is you talked about wins but i think the losses uh, mm. teach you a lot more yeah. because by definition as a venture investor you are making more bad decisions than good decisions yeah so let's say i get get involved with 100 situations in a year where there are 100 companies that you meet you make maybe 15 to 20 yes decisions mm-hmm. of those five really take off so you made sort of five good decisions out of 100 right yeah. where you made a good yes decision but then you made 10 to 15 bad decisions where you said yes but it should have actually been no so that's yeah. part and parcel of making those decisions but then out of the 100 that you passed 15 to 20 were backed by some of your our other other vcs and partners and competitors 
mm-hmm. and five or six of them took off as well so you made mm-hmm. another five six bad decisions so by definition you made like 20 bad decisions and five good decisions yeah. and being aware of the process that you followed to make those mm-hmm. decisions and constantly refining that process mm-hmm. is, is, is is to me leads to more winners where you're just constantly refining your process and being intellectually honest that the something was different in my process the hardest thing is actually to go and revisit your mindset when you were making that decision mm-hmm. and some of my poorest decisions have come because either i was too defensive uh, that you know one investment the a new investment could disrupt a existing investment or i was holding on to my point of view and thesis too hard while mm-hmm. not exploring the founders narrative or where the market was going mm-hmm. so being truly re- intellectually honest about your own mindset and what prevented you from making a good decision is the sort of the next sort of zen level of investing no that that's fantastic again what i'm hearing is pretty much you know the qualitative ends of the process and just like careful careful less in terms of the entire step of how the things unfold and just being aware self aware and i love that i think that entire flow of thought was you know a testification to how interesting venture could get and how uh, so many of us youngsters can also look at it so wonderful hearing that vikram uh now at this point you know i'd love to shift gears and also maybe understand more about the matrix culture and this particularly stems from the fact that whenever i speak to founders there's such a strong focus on culture hiring and building the organization when we talk about venture we usually hear about thesis what not right but i'd love to understand from you that as you build and as the other leaders at matrix build one of the primary institutional funds in the country how do you think about laying the guardrails of what venture looks like 15 years from today and how do you go about scaling your insights within the organization per se i i'd love to hear your bits there so so what defines institutional investing versus individual investing you, there are great individual investors and then there are institutions that make collective good decisions and then stand the test of time yeah and i think what defines great institutional investors or the culture of an institutional investor is the process followed to make mm-hmm. decisions right and yeah. i don't know if you read data leo's book right and he says principles so yeah. when you look at the culture of an investment firm it is mm-hmm. how you make decisions mm-hmm. and how you make decisions consistently and mm-hmm. does everyone understand how you make those decisions and that's the core of 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 any firm and for us mm-hmm. i was thinking about you know a few things and you know we we've actually put that down in a pretty comprehensive document the first would be founder centricity and we've been pretty vocal about that and we put it out there what does that mean it it means that we follow founders backgrounds motivations a lot while making the that process we figure out how they have actually made an impact in the world and does that help them make an impact in the area that that they've sort of chosen and third um you know do they have these motivations that can stand the test of time what is that true motivation what they make them tick which will stand the test of the time where they'll be able to make a huge impact in this particular area so that's founder centricity uh and it's hard to actually put into words but we you know you will you if you ask most founders that have experienced a matrix process they will say hey this was run very differently or the meeting was run very differently which mm-hmm. is a focus on understanding them yeah the second is we are extremely outside in uh, we call it sort of living in in the unknown that i'm happy to talk about that but trying to make sure that you're tra- you're figuring out there are lots of unknowns some of them are known to others and some yeah. of them are just unknown to everyone yeah. but living in those unknowns and, and understanding those those questions and mm-hmm. then being truly outside in mm-hmm. where we are bringing sort of the best information data expertise to bear from the outside right if you keep thinking from the inside and thinking inside out that we know what is happening we are in such fast moving market there is no chance we know what is happening yeah so you are trying to find references you finding consumers and customers who are seeing the world changing you're finding these angels and founders who have a wonderful way of looking at the world that you will never have and mm-hmm. making sure that you're doing all of that in a very uh, short period of time in what we call an outside in process 
and the last thing is strong views weekly held which is you need to get to that yes or no there's no middle ground you either are investing or you're not investing yeah. and so you have to get to that strong view but the best decisions have happened when you are able to change a yes into a no at the right point or no into a yes mm-hmm. and so you need you can't get wedded to your answer and mm-hmm. so you, you need to also figure out you can't be like a uh, like a candle candle in the wind or a twig in the wind which is just blowing from yes to no but you need to know what will move you from a yes to a no or from a no to a yes uh, mm-hmm. and so that's something we religiously practice which is each of us is from views but weekly held and we know what's going to change our answer and we actually put down that this will this is what will change the answer and then the work we do is to figure out if that answer should change or should not change now all of this i think is sort of subsumed into the kind of people that we mm-hmm. that we have because uh, we need to find people who sort of buy into this mm-hmm. uh, so we have i would say spiky angular profiles who either come with a deep expertise or you know they are forces of nature themselves Uh, or we really want to do sort of early stage investing with a passion uh, mm-hmm. that we haven't seen before but they have something which differentiates them from others and we are looking for that one spike and we are looking for people uh, also who will not were not confirmatory in their views and are looking at different angles at one point of time we were looking for a, a more commerce majors we were looking for more uh, arts and sciences guys to complement all of us who might be very engineering bottom up in our in our sort of thought process mm-hmm. um so we're looking for high potential angular profiles but people who really want have the humility to go on a learning journey mm-hmm. and are willing to actually constantly put the microscope on themselves and then learn along the way because that's what we need if they're going to become an institutional investor at matrix great no i think that again uh, is great articulation in terms of uh, the thought process i think and just uh, this line of thought shows that this has been intricately thought out and and that's very refreshing to know i think there are two pointers that i want to bring about and uh, this was from my conversation with sarthak kudas to him for spending some time with me and the other founders who've been at matrix and i've spoken about it in various interviews one thing i've realized is they talk about this entrepreneurial culture and execution first investors and these both of these traits are let's say synonymous to <laughs> founders not as much for investors with all due respect of course uh, help us understand as to okay being a part of the leadership of the fund how do you transform and scale these two practices with perhaps anecdotes if possible i think that would be a crucial piece to understand the entire circle at uh, of the culture yeah. at matrix Yeah, so we do talk about it a lot, and we actually did an offsite uh, earlier this year, and we talked about founders' mindset, mm-hmm. and we do think that is us. Right? And I, uh, we, I'd like to think it differentiates us, but I think I, there are enough people in the ecosystem who behave like that. But institutionally, mm-hmm. that's who we are, and that's who we want to um, preserve. And when we talk about founders' mindset, it is we expect our founders. to behave in a certain way and we just talked about that right yeah. that they are highly resourceful they generate choices uh, out of thin, thin air they uh, once they have figured out a choice then their uh, their execution intensity is is amazing and so we want to behave the way they would behave and so often initially we would ask the question uh, what would bhavish at ola would do in this situation what would ashish at of business do in this situation what would harshil do in this situation so it's sort of if they can do it and if we are their closest partners and they want we want to be their closest partners why can't we and why can't we behave like that initially some of it was in helping them and being their partners in their execution and so on but then that translated into uh, us right our business mm-hmm. that we are each of us are founders of our, our of this firm as well as our sectors and so if one of our founders was running this what would mm-hmm. they do would they mm-hmm. actually take no for answer would they be externalizing hey you know what they you know the other firm got to this early oh you know what uh, i was on holiday oh you know what uh, something else happened and prevented me from making a good decision oh you know what i didn't get access you don't founders don't think like that founders mm-hmm. are trying to figure out okay you know what i made a mistake next time what would i do differently 
and I'm not going to take no for an answer. Mm-hmm. And I think that it's hard to explain, but once that becomes part of your vocabulary, mm-hmm. uh, it and each new person who's coming in is sort of adding to that practice. It just becomes part of the culture of the of the firm. Great, no, that that's amazing, Vikram. Again, and I think that clarifies so much of how you're thinking about building an institutional fund for the country. And it's been amazing the kind of contribution Matrix has had uh, in the past. Uh, as we go on to you know concludatory phases of this discussion, which has been wonderful, I, I'd love to pick on two abstract things again. The first of which being, let's say a board seat, right? And now that you've been a part of some legendary boards, which are companies which have really broken through, help us understand what this inside view of a company gives you and maybe also decode the vantage point that you have by defining what a good board member can add to a company and what the tenants of one might look like. I think boards are important, mm-hmm. but beyond a point, they're not at the early stages of a, of a startup. Right. Um, and but the being a close partner to a mm-hmm. founder, especially at the early stages, is uh, what we strive to be. And I think I'm just going to repurpose what you're saying to that to that yeah. uh, uh, answer. Um, I think a role as a close partner mm-hmm. is two things. One is to generate new choices that the founder has not thought of. Mm-hmm. Because the founder is deep in the trenches and he or she is trying to deal with running this big organization and in a race against time and money. And then they've come up with some choices. And often they will call you in the middle of the night and say, hey, there's a choice. What do you think you should do? Your job is not just to say, okay, think through those choices, but from your patterns of success and failure, generate new choices. Mm -hmm. Sort of live in the unknowns and think about some of the unknowns that founders at times don't think of and what can happen mm-hmm. um, and what is the possibility that something will happen. And often founders think only in probabilities and not in that possibility and generate some of those new choices. Mm-hmm. That I would say is the primary role. Your primary, your, uh, I think at times you get into the mode of making that decision. Mm-hmm. And we are careful that we, we are not making that decision. Founders are making that decisions. They've taken a huge opportunity cost with their lives mm-hmm. and they deserve to make that decision. Yeah. Now, we might disagree with that decision. Mm-hmm. And that's the second role, which is how do you disagree without being disagreeable? And so we usually do it privately. We do it one-on-one. And sometimes if they are um, really wedded to a decision, we present it, present a lot of data Mm-hmm. which tells them what are the counterpoints to it. After that, they deserve to make the decision. And we have to go along with that, that journey. And then you just have to support it. You can't revisit that decision. Again. So I would say that's the first big thing. Generate choices mm-hmm. and help them make good judgment. But mm-hmm. then leave it to them to make that big choice. I think the second is to provide support and energy. Um, I think founders have unbelievable reservoirs of internal energy that yeah. keeps them going. Yeah. But sometimes even then they, they need support energy from time to time. Mm. Uh, and I think that's where the magical partnerships happen. When mm. you're there uh, as a source of support mm-hmm. and it can be pretty lonely in those, in those times. And are you there as a partner in, the, in those times? Mm-hmm. So I think that's what sort of early partnership is of, about. Right. As board scale, um, I think the best run boards, and I because I don't want to avoid your question, the best <laughs> run boards are the ones which have enough differing points of view. They're not either completely contentious, where they're not able to figure out how to work together, or you know completely, you know either disinterested or just cheerleaders. Yeah. But there are enough differing points of view, and each person is driving like one role within the board. Yeah. So, sometimes one person is driving uh, m and finance, things like that. Some person is taking the lead on audit and compliance as you go towards an IPO. Sometimes mm-hmm. people are actually playing a critical role in hiring. And I think mm-hmm. one of the things that founders do, and I actually uh, done a podcast with Rajinder on yeah, yeah. boards and board composition, which is still not out. Uh, hopefully it should out, get, be out this week. But 
defining those roles for board members um, actually lead, leads to the founders getting the best out of the board as well as sort of harmonious functioning. Yeah. And that, that's, again, very comprehensive. But we can one evident thing from your conversations in some of these Matrix Moments episodes or how founders refer to you has been the close relation you share with some of these folks, right? Uh, and this was something that was pointed out in my research as well, that you stay intricately involved and you're almost always there. What I'm trying to refer to there is, without the praise, is pretty much how do you develop and become that first point of connect, that first point of, let's say, touch at any given point, be it a good or a bad one? How do you do that and fill those shoes as a venture investor can be the guardrails to actually becoming a successful one. So if you have any secret sources there that you can share with us, I think that'd be amazing. I don't actually. Um, I, if I decode it, I, I think it is maybe two, three things. One is authenticity. Just be authentic mm -hmm. and be who you are. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times as investors, you're putting on a, a robe or putting on a face, mm -hmm. uh, which is not your true face or the, the and founders see through it. Mm -hmm. So be authentic and just say this is who you are. And if mm -hmm. you're genuinely curious as, about their business, as well as just want to be a humble but close partner, on their journey, founders welcome you. And so mm -hmm. if you're authentic about it, I think that founders just see it. The second is some level of reliability um, on being there in the moments that count. Right? It, when, when there's a sign of trouble and can you immediately, mm -hmm. uh, can they immediately reach you and you're spending an inordinate amount of time at yeah. Then they'll call you again and again. Well, I, they'll call you when they're in trouble and they'll call, they'll, they'll be the first port of call when there's a big success. Yeah. So, uh, and I do tell founders and I, and now I have, you know, I'm working with founders where somebody else in the team has let a deal, but I'm actually available. I always mm -hmm. tell them that there might be times where I don't respond to you on every WhatsApp, but just say trouble or just describe something is happening. Then I, I will drop what I'm doing and, I, and I'll call you. And you have to actually live up to that promise. Yeah. where you're reliable when when there's trouble. Absolutely. Authenticity and walking the talk, I think uh, that's what I'm hearing. And those are two so amazing the, points. The last thing I would say is, is when you're generating choices, especially mm -hmm. when you know there are big decisions to happening, happening, fundraises, whether to sell the company, whether to make a hire and so on. If you can suspend your ego and your agenda, mm -hmm and really truly think for the for the founder mm. then it makes you want to call them again and again that mm. is not to say that we are just the founder's best friend and we'll just do whatever they want mm -hmm. and often i actually say hey this is what i want mm -hmm. but this might be what is best for you mm. and this is where some of it on the margin i would love if you optimize for me and, and get me to this mm -hmm. and having that conversation openly Versus having a passive aggressive agenda that, hey, this is what you want. And then you're trying to manipulate them. Again, mm -hmm. founders see through it. So mm -hmm. uh, I found the best conversation to say, hey, this is what I want. And mm -hmm. this is, and then this is what I need. Mm -hmm. But these are your choices. And this, I think, is the best choice. Now, because we are partners, I'd love for you to optimize something around this and get me here. right? Mm -hmm. And having that as an open conversation uh, mm -hmm. actually leads to the best relationship. Absolutely. I can only imagine anything that shows. And yeah, honesty can go a really, really long way and stems from the point of authenticity as well. So love that, Vikram. Uh, I think, you know, uh, but, uh, Vikram, this has been very, very interesting. And as we close down, I'd love to just pick on very quickly two, three questions, which are specifically on your investor persona. This is a same set of same questions that I ask to most folks on the show. And so for you, I think the first question there is on context switching. I mean, that's such a fundamental role of an investor. Uh, and one thing that I've noticed again is, okay, you've been able to go back and forth and go deep as well as go broad in multiple situations through this conversation as well. So if you had to give any bits as to how do you go from one sector to another, one company to another, one scenario to another, that would be great to hear. I think the hardest part of being an investor is context switching every half an hour to every hour. Yeah. And uh, one trick that I actually often employ is mm -hmm. actually changing my room or changing my position. It almost, you sort of switch your context with your feet. 
mm-hmm. it sort of forces you into a physical yeah. space and mm-hmm. you'll see that i i actually do that i haven't done that in this podcast <laughs> but i usually will walk yeah. around and and it helps you uh, and mm-hmm. i sometimes do it consciously mm-hmm. uh, go for a walk sometimes i ask for a walking meeting you know mm-hmm. ask for a coffee and so on so that's one uh, second is to prepare the key questions mm-hmm. often you are sort of dealing with let's say hey how do i do you know runway management you know in a discussion and then mm-hmm. you're suddenly switching to how do i actually figure out this growth engine for this company mm-hmm. and these are like completely different yeah things and and often if you don't force that context switch you will end up marrying these two discussions and both will be suboptimal yeah so figuring out what are the questions that you really want to answer going into it um mm-hmm. is probably the thing that helps me the most Oh, that's great i think uh, physically like living up to context switching and then just being you know prepared for a situation is my cue from there uh, the second part of uh, this is pretty much around staying ahead of the curve so when you try to find these hidden gems and you know become a master at a subject that is unexplored when you talk about the unknowns as well it's easier said than done so if you have any mental models around ensuring that you know you know what you're talking about and staying ahead of the curve in a particular discipline domain have that thesis how do you establish that how do you enable that that be great it's the reverse of what you said i actually mm-hmm. i'm in the mode of i don't know what i'm talking about okay and the more i am in the hey i know only 5 10% of mm-hmm. something the more i am in listening mode and where you know somebody says something mm-hmm. and you are like oh you know what that's not something i know instead right. of saying oh i know something about it and often you will see people say oh i know something about it and you're trying to add to the discussion versus hey tell me more and often mm-hmm. it is in these conversations you know with founders operators who are very deep in in what they are doing and they suddenly say something and mm-hmm. at that point of time if you are in the i don't know enough and you are you just follow their their narrative then suddenly you are on to something now mm-hmm. even they might not know how big uh you know what they've said is but mm-hmm. if you follow their thought process sometimes you can figure it out Awesome. No, that's great. I mean, uh, doing the reverse and not knowing enough so that you can know eventually is my cue. Just listening and having that student's mindset, I think, just like learning on the go. Uh, that's, a, that's a great cue for sure. Uh, the last one here is pretty much in terms of prioritization. I mean, again, all of these things follow the pattern of considering there's so much breadth in the venture business especially for somebody who is handling at th- things at a both micro level and a macro level how do you prioritize the important ones what what are your mental models there that'll be great so it's honestly uh, more pr- how do you manage your time through the day mm-hmm. because uh, uh, if i just responded to everything that everyone threw at me that's my day and i don't know if i would actually be moving things along at all mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so i start my day with what do i want to get done today which mm-hmm. is um where i can make the most impact and then i usually get to those very early in my day with mm-hmm. the highest amount of energy sometimes before everyone wakes up sometimes this pocket of time that no one knows and will be on the calendar and blocked and so yeah. get to those very early which is things i want to get done especially if it's something complex and it's going to take other people through the day to get stuff done then i make sure that i put it on their plate to make sure mm. it gets done i think the second uh, thing is who are the most important people in my life and mm-hmm. it sometimes it's founders sometimes it's partners internally sometimes it's partners externally and do they may need something big from me right sometimes mm. they might think it is big and important it might not be right so you also have to put <laughs> and then get to those Mm. Uh, and then that becomes sort of prioritization um i think that same philosophy you have to th- this is how i plan my day and plan my week that mm-hmm. same philosophy if you apply to how you are planning your next 3 6 months mm-hmm. then you know you're able to get to big things early you know you know building yeah. out your team helping build some part of uh, your uh, your your company's organization uh mm-hmm. thinking of one or two big business development or m and a events all of that if you start 
putting a longer timeline on it, you get to those choices. Makes sense. I think uh, what I've taken from there is just be more proactive as opposed to reactive in nature. And I think that can be so crucial. Uh, often in times, you know, you get so stuck in executing, which is, of course, a trade that is necessary. Can't really look at the larger picture, but I can see you planning very well and talking about that proactiveness. Uh, this has been great, Vikram. And as we close down, I'd rather be stereotypical here, but, you know, we've spoken about a bunch of aspects, different places, different stuff. But if you had to summarize the most important, I wouldn't say learnings, but let's say the downfalls that you've had, the wins that you've had, if you had to just put it, buckle it up together and maybe, you know, talk to a series A founder or let's say a seed stage founder via this podcast. If you had to summarize three of your learnings for them, what would you leave us with? I think that'd be a great concludatory point. So number one would be focus on the big, big things. Actually, let me step back. Your role in, a, in your organization is to, sorry, I think I lost you there for a second. No worries. Uh, your role in, in the organization is to provide the next boost, right? And figure out the next orbit. And I almost, always equate, the, I have this analogy that founding a startup is like sending a rocket ship to the moon, right? Mm -hmm. Lots of rockets <laughs> usually don't take off the ground. So it needs a lot yeah. of preparation and a lot of serendipity to come together for it to get off. But once it goes off, mm -hmm. then you need to have fire the boosters at the right point for it to go to the next level of orbit, next level of orbit. Otherwise, it'll just come crashing down. Mm -hmm. And as a founder and top team, your job is to discover that next booster, next booster, next booster. And Sometimes it is hiring and figuring mm -hmm. out the next, next 10, 15 hires. Sometimes it's, it's actually getting them resources, which is money. Sometimes it is figuring out the best choices where you say, uh, I'm going to focus on marketing versus I'm going to focus on ops. So figuring out at any point of time, what is the next booster for the next two weeks, for the next month is your, is your role. And then after that, you have to focus 70, 80% of time on that one big thing. And I, and I see the great founders, that's what they do. They actually don't do a lot. They, they just focus their entire energy on just that one activity, 70, 80% of the time. And then the 20% of the time they're managing. Right? They have to manage the org and uh, yeah. do what the org needs them to do. But that founder energy is going towards that big thing and mm -hmm. that big booster. So those would be the top two. The third is you're in a race against time and money. Mm -hmm. And taking sort of middle of the road decisions and managing lots of different variables at that uh, at all times doesn't help you in that way. You actually have to make these polarizing decisions that, you know, I'm going to commit towards growth. I'm going to commit towards, you know, uh, cash burn at different points in time. I want to commit towards, towards hiring. You have to make these committal choices and you mm -hmm. can't say, okay, you know what, I'm going to do parts of this, parts of this, parts of this and cobble it together. That mm -hmm. sort of doesn't work at all these days. And that, that's awesome to hear. And I think a wonderful, wonderful note. What I've observed throughout the conversation is a lot of clarity of thought and great articulation. And I think that's given at least me a lot of food for thought and hopefully everyone listening in. Thank you so much, Vikram, for your time. I think this has been such a, such a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed it as well. No, I enjoyed it a lot. And frankly, it was some of the most thought-provoking questions I've got in a while. And, you know, yeah. these questions sort of force clarity of thought as well. So thank you for doing all the research and hosting this. Thank you so much, Vikram. Uh, 